For all intents and purposes, railway locomotives cannot climb hills or mountains. There are some lines that climb a portion of certain mountains, and there are others that follow relatively shallow inclines over hills, but in general, a locomotive would not be able to make it up a mountain. Not only are most locomotives too heavy, but the wheels have very little friction to grip the track with, which is why it's easy to push something on rails and why trains can go so fast, but it also means they have terrible traction in comparison to a car. So in short, railways and locomotives cannot climb hills or mountains. Steam locomotives, however, do not care what science tells us. The Snowdon Mountain Railway is a 7.6 km long railway that climbs the Snowdon Mountain, frequently running trains from the base of the mountain to the summit. It's the only rack and pinion railway in the UK, but there are many others like it around the world, such as Switzerland, Tasmania, and America. The line was opened to the public in 1896 and has been operated almost every year since. Now you're probably thinking, how the hell does it do that? We've just established that trains can't go up hills. How has this black magic been allowed to continue for so long? Well, you'd be part right to think that. Most locomotives cannot climb steep gradients. The engines that run on the Snowdon Railway, however, have a trick up their sleeves. Rack rails. In between the rails going all the way up the mountain is a stretch of track that has metal teeth fitted to it. The track and locomotives were designed and built in Switzerland and are fitted with gears in the center of their axles which slot into the rack rails, allowing them to climb the steep gradients. But you can't just slap a cog onto an engine's axle and expect it to work. Other changes needed to be made to make a steam locomotive locomotive go uphill. The boiler has to be angled downwards, else all the water would flow to the back of the boiler and leave some of the heating tubes uncovered, decreasing the efficiency of the engine and possibly damaging the boiler. The cylinders are on backwards to help with the engine's gearing, the water gauges are mounted at the centre of the locomotive so the water level doesn't change with the gradient the engine is climbing, and the water tanks are divided into two sections, with a smaller water tank at the front holding water to cool the engine when running downhill. It's also important that they operate safely. On the Snowdon Railway, each engine only takes up one coach or truck at a time so the load isn't too heavy. The coaches are pushed up the mountain instead of pulled to avoid strain on couplings, the engines aren't coupled to the coaches unless they're shunting, the coaches have their own strong brakes, and the engines have automatic air brakes that apply themselves if the engine is going too fast. All these are thoroughly tested and maintained to ensure both the engine crew and passengers are safe. This, however, didn't always stop accidents. On its opening day in 1896, the Snowdon Railway dispatched two trains to the summit. On the first trip down, engine number one, Ladas, was carrying two carriages when it lost grip of the track and ran out of control, derailing and falling down the mountain. Everyone survived apart from one man who died from blood loss after jumping from one of the speeding coaches. The second train on its way down collided with the stopped carriages, luckily without any fatalities. The locomotive was salvaged and used for spare parts, while the owners of the line purchased some new, lighter carriages. The line was then later reopened and September later that year. Despite this, the railway has always been an important part of the mountain, helping carry supplies up to the mountain summit when the summit cafe was being built, and helping hikers and tourists see the view of the mountain. The line has also been used to save people's lives. In 2015, a Coast Guard helicopter was unable to reach the summit of the mountain due to winds reaching up to 70 miles an hour. A 17-year-old girl had collapsed from an asthma attack near the summit while sheltering from the gale. An engine was dispatched and managed to make its way to the top, bringing her to to the foot of the mountain where she was rushed away via ambulance. So not only is the line still important to this day, but it's also another testament to the fact that, no matter what the terrain, someone will find a way for a railway to conquer it. The National Railway Museum in York is home to many impressive engines, such as Mallard, Lodestar, and a working replica of Stevenson's rocket. Most of these engines have done something to earn a spot in the museum, either beating a record or simply possessing significant design features. One engine, however, stands out among the rest, not because it earned its way into the museum, but rather because it was designed to be in the museum. Evening Star is unique among British steam engines as not only was it the last steam locomotive built by British Rail, but it was also marked for preservation from the day it was completed. On top of that, it is one of the few British Rail locomotives to ever carry a name while in service. Most 9Fs were built to pull freight and goods trains, but Evening Star also got the privilege of pulling passenger and express trains, and was well looked after while in service, often being used as an exhibition piece as well as being painted green instead of goods engine black like the rest of the 9Fs. 
The engine pulled multiple flagship expresses on the western region of British Rail, sometimes having to delay its arrival at stations to allow for completion of restaurant services because it was running so early. It is also well documented that it could outperform BR's Britannia locomotives that were designed for high-speed passenger and express trains, with many people recounting observing Evening Star overtaking other expresses. Evening Star was also known to have clocked speeds of up to 90 miles an hour on some later express trains, however it was put back into goods and freight work after concerns were raised over possible damage to the running gear, as the engine wasn't designed for such speeds, only occasionally pulling fast passenger trains after that. Evening Star only worked for five years before being withdrawn and replaced by diesel locomotives in 1965. It was preserved in the National Collection and was overhauled into working order in 1966. Whereas other locomotives had to earn their place in preservation, be it City of Truro and Flying Scotsman going 100 miles an hour, engines having historical significance, or simply being in the right place at the right time, Evening Star was simply built to be a museum piece. Despite this, it still managed to show how versatile its design was, doing jobs it wasn't designed to do better than some of the engines explicitly designed to do them. Talk about showing off. American railroads have always been interesting when it comes to the development of their locomotives. The heavier loading gauges on most of their tracks allowed them to experiment in ways that wasn't possible in countries like the UK. While it led to some of the heaviest and most powerful machines to run on rails, along the way there were a few standout experiments. Introducing Camelback Locomotives There were two variants of the design. The early type, designed by Ross Winans around the 1850s, and the second type that came later around the 1870s. Winans' original design involved mounting the cab and seating compartments on top of the locomotive's boiler to put as much weight on the driving wheels as possible in order to increase the engine's traction. These were known simply as camels. The additional weight helped improve traction, and the design was later refined to a 460 wheel arrangement, however the benefits weren't enough to justify the awkward design. Design. Most camel locomotives were eventually used as inspection vehicles for railway directors, saving the need for special coaches. Later, John E. Wooten designed the Wooten firebox to burn waste coal, saving railway companies a large sum of money. The issue was the firebox was very wide, meaning the driver wouldn't be able to see ahead if the cab was mounted at the back of the engine. To get around this, the engines were designed so their cabs were mounted astride the boiler. The fireman, however, would still be located at the back of the engine with minimal protection from the elements. These engines were known as camelbacks because of their unusual design. Despite the weird appearance, the engines worked surprisingly well, saving the companies a significant amount of money in fuel costs as well as reliably hauling both goods and passenger trains. Most of the camelback designs were built in the 1920s but were still used well into the 1950s. The design wasn't by any means perfect however. Drivers were concerned about the fact they were positioned above the wheels and side rods, and that should the wheels slip and anything break, they'd be impaled by the broken side rods. As the rear of the engine didn't have a proper cab, the fireman would often be exposed to the elements while shoveling coal, eventually leading to the Interstate Commerce Commission to fully ban the construction of camelbacks by 1927. Some crews in Philadelphia and Reading referred to the engines as Mother Hubbards, while other crews from New Jersey called them snappers. After the introduction of mechanical stokers, most camelbacks had their cabs repositioned to the rear of the engine as the mechanical stokers required the rear deck of the engine to be set higher meaning the driver could see over the broad firebox. Not all were changed, but any engines that had mechanical stokers fitted would have their cabs repositioned. Overall, camelback locomotives are a very interesting solution to a rather peculiar problem. Sure, the cab could have been mounted higher at the back, but given how it likely wasn't feasible during the design stages of the build, I'd say the solution we got was alright. Hey, it's just like they say, if it works, it ain't stupid. Have you ever needed a steam locomotive for your railway so much that you just slapped a boiler and some cylinders onto a spare flatbed wagon, only to accidentally create one of the most versatile steam locomotives ever? Because that's what this guy did. Born in 1839, Ephraim Shea worked as a teacher, a clerk, and a civil servant before saying, sod this office job, I'm going to become a lumberjack. He started his own logging company around the 1860s and wanted a better way of moving his logs to the mill, as he could only use snow sleds, meaning he could only move logs in winter. He constructed a narrow gauge tramway in 1875 to transport the trees which allowed him to cut logs all year round. 
Eventually, Shay needed some sort of locomotive to run the line. As there wasn't any way he could buy engines to run on the narrow gauge rails at the time, he took a flatbed wagon that was used to carry the logs and just mounted a boiler to it. He then fitted two cylinders onto the boiler that would drive a set of wheels on the rear bogey of the flatbed. The driving wheels of the design underwent several changes, with chains and belts being used to power the wheels. The final design instead saw two cylinders mounted on the right side of the frame pointing downwards. These were connected to a drive shaft which powered the wheels with beveled gears. The drive shaft was also flexible, which allowed the bogies to articulate, meaning it could negotiate tight corners much better. Because of the positioning of the cylinders, the boiler had to be set slightly to the left in order to counterbalance the cylinder's weight, giving the overall locomotive a unique profile. After getting the design patented, the Lima Locomotive Works of Ohio built Shea a prototype engine in 1880. The engine was well equipped for the job and could pull the timber wagons with ease. The design was later improved, with a newer class B-type being built in 1884 that was fitted with a third cylinder. In 1885, a class C-type was built that had three cylinders and an additional set of bogies fitted to the frame, giving it more tractive effort, and a class D was made with four sets of bogies. The Shea design was very successful and was used all over the United States in quarries, factories, logging railways, and even plantation work. Its ability to accelerate quickly with heavy loads and run over steep and uneven tracks meant there was very little heavy duty work the engine couldn't do. With all of its wheels powered and with weight on all of them, the engine had a very high tractive effort, although the small wheels and the way they were driven meant the engine didn't have a very high top speed. After Shea's patent on the locomotive's design expired, the Willamette Iron and Steel Works started to build their own Shea locomotives that were essentially copies of Shea's original design. They were called Willamette met locomotives for legal reasons, but most still refer to them as Shays. Other nicknames for the engines were Sidewinders or Stemwinders because of their unusual side-mounted drive shafts. Many were exported to around 30 different countries where they continue to show their usefulness, with some being sent to Australia and other such countries with booming logging businesses. While not the fastest or most elegant looking engines, the Shays were powerful for their size and served well for many years. 118 Shea locomotives have been preserved with many still running on preserved lines. Just goes to show how far improvisation can take you. How many ugly ducklings were there? Most fairy tales tell you there's none because some dipstick thought a signet was a duckling. I'm here to inform you that, as far as British locomotion is concerned, there were 40 ugly ducklings, and you'd have to be a royal dipstick to confuse them for anything other than a locomotive. Introducing the Southern Railway Q1 class, better known as Ugly Ducklings, Coffee Pots, Charlies, Biscuit Tins, Clockworks, and most insultingly, Frankensteins. During the Second World War, Southern Railway was one of the most important railways working in England, as it covered the south coasts where German bombers and other Axis forces would frequently attempt to assault, essentially making it the frontline railway. This meant Southern needed to have engines ready to pull heavy goods, military supplies, and trains full of soldiers at a moment's notice. But they had an issue. Southern Railway was primarily a commuter railway that was electrifying most of their lines, so they were never too concerned with efficient freight engines. The current Q class of freight engines were heavy and old-fashioned, and while they could pull basic freight trains easily enough, they weren't ideal for quickly hauling troops and supply trains at a moment's notice. Southern's new chief designer, Oliver Bullied, drew up some 060 engines, focusing on keeping them light, powerful, and to use the minimal amount of materials possible possible to build them. He ended up designing the Q1s, which were not only up for the job, but also very unusual in their appearance, earning many of the previous nicknames. They were also stripped of most unessential features to help save on resources. The wheels didn't have splashes to cover them, the casing was square to help with the boiler insulation and to make them easier to clean, and the frames at the front were so short that cleaners would have to lay a plank of wood on top of the buffers just so they had a decent footing when cleaning the smoke box. Despite their looks and lack of comfort, the Q1s were far from disappointing. Their light weight allowed them to run on 97% of Southern's rails. They were quick and were some of the most powerful 060 engines to ever run on British rails, meaning there wasn't a whole lot they couldn't do. They were even used until 1966, long after their intended lifespan as wartime necessities. After the formation of British Rail, they were given the power classification of 5F, which meant they were roughly as powerful as an LMS Black 5. 
quite impressive for its size. It's also rumoured that after being built, Oliver Bullied sat comfortably on the coal pile in one of the Q1's tenders during testing as it was travelling 60 miles an hour backwards. It's fair to say they were exactly what was needed for the war and far exceeded people's expectations. They weren't entirely flawless as the engines were known to have poor braking on heavy goods trains and their lack of comfort made them somewhat unpopular among footplate crews, but aside from that, the Q1s were exceptional machines that outperformed themselves longer after their intended lifespan. There's one left in preservation currently residing at the National Railway Museum. The lessons to take away from this? Looks aren't everything, and sometimes having less can make you do more. In the late 1930s, the Union Pacific had introduced its new Challenger locomotives to the main line over the Wasatch Range between Green River and Ogden. With a total of 12 driving wheels, these engines were equipped for running up and down most of the grades present on the line. However, the eastward grade from Ogden to Wasatch was still too steep for these engines, and as such, the trains would have to be double-headed to complete the trip. The Union Pacific wanted one engine alone to be able to make the trip, and so rather than running shorter, more frequent trains, they decided to double down and make the engines bigger. The American Locomotive Company was tasked with building these engines, and decided to base the new designs on the currently operating Challenger locomotives. They found that by simply making the firebox bigger, increasing the boiler pressure, decreasing the size of the driving wheels, and adding an extra two wheels to each set of driving bogies, they could fulfill Union Pacific's needs. Given the sheer size of this 4884 design, some aspects of the locomotive Motive was simplified, with compounding, booster, and feed water heaters being taken out, and the standard Baker valve gear being swapped out for good old fashioned Walschwerts. The Challengers were already big enough engines, but the changes put in place to create these new locomotives made them even bigger. The engine alone of these new designs was 85 feet long, roughly 10 feet bigger than the Challengers. They were also 11 feet wide, 16 feet tall, and weighed 350 metric tons. To call them big would be an understatement, especially as they currently hold the record for the biggest steam locomotives ever built in terms of both weight and length. Supposedly, these engines were going to be classified as Wasatches, after the mountain ranges they were built to work on. However, an unknown employee of the American Locomotive Company chalked the words Big Boy onto the smokebox door of number 4000 while it was under construction. Most workers found the name humorous, and it stuck as a result, leading to the entire class of engines officially being known as the Big Boy. Boys. When they finally came into service in 1941, they were more than equipped for the work they were built for, easily hauling the heavy loads they were given up the steep and unforgiving grades of the Wasatch line. During service, their rated haulage tonnage was increased several times as it was found that the engines were actually more powerful than the Union Pacific first realised. Despite their capabilities, the big boys normally operated well below 60 miles an hour while in freight service, being designed with a wide margin of reliability and safety. Footplate crews also held the big boys with high regard, as they were reliable, sure-footed, and very user-friendly. The only real problems the big boys had were their awkward size and their appetite. Just like many of the other massive engines running on the Union Pacific, their sheer size made shunting difficult, though not impossible. The amount of fuel they burned was also quite excessive. They mostly ran on low-grade coal, and as such required more of it to fire consistently, with a big boy on average burning 11 tons of coal an hour while operating at full power. Union Pacific tried to save on fuel by modifying number 4005 to burn oil in 1946. However, the experiment didn't work out and it was converted back to burning coal in 1948. Despite their reliability and power, the big boys only remained in service for little over 20 years due to the sharp increase in coal and labour prices after the war, and the introduction of much cheaper to operate and maintain diesel electric engines. The last revenue earning train pulled by a big boy ran in July of 1959. All of them were put into storage, but the last wasn't officially taken out of service until 1962. Unsurprisingly, many have been preserved, with eight still remaining out of the 25 built. Seven are currently on display at various museums around the country, with number 4014 being restored in 2019 and running various excursions to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the first transcontinental railroad. All in all, the big boys somewhat represent the last hurrah of steam locomotion, not only being the biggest steam engines in the world, but also really pushing the limits and showing what steam power was truly capable of.
just goes to show that sometimes the right tool for the job isn't always an overly engineered machine. Sometimes all you need is just one big boy. As steam locomotion developed, many designers tried to tackle the problem of visibility. Because the cab is usually set at the back, drivers would have some of their view ahead partially blocked by the boiler. While this was never too much of a problem, as signs and signals were positioned clearly and away from blind spots, in an ideal world, the driver would have no blind spots whatsoever. As such, many locomotive designers over the years have tried to find a way to put the cab at the front of the engine, with varying degrees of success. One of the first cab forward designs came from the US in the 1860s from Matthias Forney. Forney's design was pretty straightforward, essentially being an 044 tank engine, with as much of the boiler's weight as possible on the driving wheels to increase the engine's traction. Because of how uneven the tracks of most of the railroads were, pilot wheels were essential to help help engines traverse and run along the rough rails. This meant Forney's engines essentially had to be driven in reverse, which, because they were tank engines, was fairly easy to do. While their limited capacity for fuel and water was one of their biggest drawbacks, they were eventually found to work best in cities, running short commuter services. Aside from tank engines, most attempts at a cab-fronted tender engine usually came with more complications than benefits. In Italy, between 1900 and 1906, 43 cab forward engines were built to run passenger services along the Po Valley, earning the nicknames of Mucca, the Italian word for cow. While they could hit speeds of up to 110 km an hour, having the cab mounted at the front had little benefit over more conventional designs, especially as it limited the amount of coal the engine could carry, further limiting the engine's range. With no real benefit gained from having the cab at the front, no more were built, and by the late 1930s, all had been withdrawn and scrapped. A similar story came in the form of the German State Railways Class 05. One of them was built with a cab forwards design, however, this did little to improve the engine's overall performance. Number 05-002 famously broke the steam speed record in 1936, hitting 124.5 miles an hour. But this was one of the engines that had a conventional cab layout, not the cab forward design. Eventually, the cab forward 05 was refitted with a standard cab position. While setting the cab to the front on any vehicle really is optimal, as it allows for a much better view of the path ahead, on steam locomotives with tenders, it presents many problems, namely access to the tender. As the tender often carries the water and fuel for the locomotive, it's best that it's kept as close to the firebox as possible to make it easier to transfer fuel and water. Most cab forward designs simply involve flipping the engine around so that the firebox and controls are at the front. However, this means if the locomotive is coal-fired, coal couldn't be kept in a tender at the back and so a bunker would have to be installed at the front of the engine, which would most likely be unable to hold anywhere near as much coal as a tender thus significantly limiting the range of the engine, and by now you've basically got an overly complicated tank engine. Alternatively, a separate cab could be mounted at the front for the driver and one at the rear for the fireman. This too is an issue as it makes communication between the driver and fireman more difficult, if not impossible, especially on bigger locomotives. Not to mention that should either the driver or fireman fall ill, pass out, or otherwise become incapacitated, then there'd be no way for the other to know or help out. So, all in all, putting the cab at the front of a steam locomotive is usually an impractical idea. However, there is one exception to this rule. The Southern Pacific Railroad faced a unique problem. Along the Sierra Nevada was approximately 39 long tunnels and nearly 40 miles of snowsheds, meaning many engine crews would end up nearly choking to death on fumes from their locomotive while in these tunnels. To get around this, it was decided that engines would be driven tender first so that smoke, ash and soot from the funnel would be exhausted behind the footplate crew, keeping the air clearer so they could actually breathe. The problem with this, however, was the tender of the engine would block most of the driver's view and meant the train couldn't travel very fast running tender first. To get around this, Southern Pacific ordered several locomotives that could run cab forwards. The design was based on an earlier experimental locomotive built by the North Pacific Coast Railroad, which basically entailed flipping the locomotive around and having the tender connected to the smokebox end. They were also designed to burn oil instead of coal, which 
negated the fueling problems that most cab forward designs had. Not only did the forward-facing cabs have much better visibility, but having the exhausted smoke and steam at the back meant the crew were better protected from the fumes produced by the engine. The design worked as intended, and these cab forward or cab aheads as they were known became a frequent sight along the railroad. Not to say that they were entirely perfect, the main reason all oil-burning steam locomotives didn't simply reverse the engine like this was because of the risk of oil leaks. Because the oil had to be piped to the front of the engines, in front of all the driving wheels, should a leak happen it would cause massive wheel slip, effectively rendering the engines useless. An oil leak of this nature also caused an incident in 1941, when wet rails caused the train to slip in the tunnel at Santa Susana Pass near Los Angeles. As as the train slipped, a coupling broke, causing the air brakes to automatically come on, stalling the engine in the tunnel which was beginning to fill with fumes. Oil also started to leak from the pipes under the engine, which ignited the wooden rail tyres under the cab. The combination of heat and fumes resulted in the death of the footplate crew. Despite their faults, these cab forward engines worked for many years until they were eventually replaced by diesel locomotives. All were scrapped, with only one example, number 4294, being preserved. Observed. Overall, cab forward steam locomotive designs have always been a very interesting concept that many engineers have tried to tackle, and few have been able to master. The lack of any real long term benefits and the complications that arose from modifying the engine's layout made the idea pretty pointless for most. However, there were a few exceptions in the end that made them useful. Perhaps then, backwards thinking isn't as bad as we all think it is. Well, for locomotive design anyway. With factories and workshops getting bigger, workers found themselves in need of something to help them lift and move heavy loads around. At the same time, they were also in need of shunting engines capable of moving and organising many of the trucks that carried supplies and minerals around the site too. Most steam cranes were either too big or too slow to fit inside factory buildings and move trucks around effectively, and most shunting engines lacked any means of helping lift heavy loads off the ground. In an ideal world, they needed an engine that was a combination of both a crane and a shunting load locomotive. So they built just that, introducing crane tank engines. The first record I can find of one being built was in 1872 for the North London Railway. Formerly an 040 shunting engine, it was rebuilt into an 042 with a small steam crane set above the back axle. It's not specified what it was built for, but it was likely used around the engine works carrying parts and helping assemble other locomotives. The Great Western followed suit not too long after, modifying a broad gauge tank engine into a standard gauge 240 in 1881, with a crane mounted in place of the coal bunker. Once completed, it operated around the locomotive works at Swindon. They later built another two crane engines in 1901, both being modified pannier tanks named Cyclops and Steropes respectively, with a third engine, Hercules, being built later in 1922. The cranes were capable of lifting six tons and had an 18-foot radius, making them more than suited to any work that needed doing. They mostly worked at Swindon, However, Cyclops spent a considerable amount of its working life at the Stafford Road Locomotive Works in Wolverhampton. One of them also spent a weekend in Paddington in 1931, helping move preset concrete sections into place while work was being done extending a platform. These engines were eventually withdrawn and scrapped in 1936. By this point, many companies had designed and built their own crane tanks for various uses. The Great Northern Railway modified a G2 engine in a similar manner to the Great Western Railway albeit with a much smaller crane. Nielsen and co built tank engines which were much smaller and involved the crane being mounted around the engine's funnel. Rather than being built for use in locomotive works, these were designed for factory work and other basic industrial jobs. Robert Stevenson and Hawthorne put together a few engines out of spare parts they had after an overseas order was cancelled. The cranes of these engines had a 20-foot radius, but weren't fitted with winches. Instead, hooks were set in place on the arm at different lengths to carry different amounts of weight. The crane arm also had a gap to allow it to slip over the engine's chimney when not in use. Possibly the most well-known design is the crane tanks built by Dubs & Co of Glasgow, with its crane mounted in the middle of its boiler with a slightly curved design to allow the arm to safely pass over the engine's cabin funnel. There are many other designs built by many other companies, but the main difference is usually boil down to the size of the crane and the power of the locomotives. Their versatility led to them being used all over the UK and other parts of the world. 
not only in locomotive works, but doing other jobs as well. Many ended up working in factories, moving and loading supplies. Others worked around goods yards that required transferring smaller loads like metal pipes and machine parts from one wagon to another. And quite a few worked around docks and shipyards, not only helping unload ships, but also moving parts needed to build and repair them. Depending on the work, some were further modified, with some engines working at steel mills being fitted with electromagnets powered by steam generators fitted to the engine. Despite them essentially being a direct upgrade compared to most other shunting engines, they weren't entirely perfect. Naturally, the addition of a crane arm came with all the dangers of operating a crane. However, drivers also had to take care while moving the engine while the crane was carrying a load, as braking or accelerating too sharply could cause the load to swing about, not something that's particularly desired in a crowded workshop. On top of this, the arm of most crane engines reached past their buffers, meaning they'd likely accidentally hit any coaches or taller goods wagons if the driver wasn't careful, significantly limiting the kinds of trucks and wagons it was safe for them to shunt and work with. The additional weight and height of the cranes also limited where they could go. While most factories and shunting yards were capable of supporting them, many still preferred an engine with a smaller profile as they were much easier to accommodate. And finally was their lack of fuel storage. The cranes on many of these engines sat where their bunkers would be, and the ones with bunkers still couldn't hold much in reserve. This was never a problem for the most part, as working in dockyards and factories usually meant they were never too far away from a place they could refuel. However, it did significantly limit their range outside of shunting, meaning they were useless if they needed to travel any further than the yards they worked in. While none of these things were ever a massive issue while they worked, they were limiting factors in regards to the work they could do outside of just shunting and lifting things. Many locomotive works did away with crane tanks after the 1930s, however, many still continued to work in yards and factories well into the 1960s, with some in the UK working as late as the 1970s. In the end, they were gradually phased out by smaller road cranes and the overall decline of railway usage across the country. Quite a few different crane engines have been preserved and are both running on and displayed at various railways and museums. All in all, crane tank engines are certainly a quirky niche design that turned out to be just the right tool for the job. While they didn't exactly cause a boom in the world of railway engineering, they certainly lifted the potential steam engines had to adapt to different roles. Sure, not everyone quite likes their jib, but for many, their unique appearance and practicality is enough to leave them hooked. Subscribe for more.